In this presentation I should like to look at what research reveals about how we, are, how we all learn. I want to provoke thought but it's based on evidence and allow you to work through the implications for your own teaching. What does research reveal about how we all learn? The problem is we start with this word learn or learning and it brings up all kinds of pictures in our mind. What do we actually mean by learning? Seems such a straightforward question. I want to start with this by looking at human beings of all shapes and sizes. That's the one thing that's true about us all. We're looking at things round about and we're looking for patterns, things that make sense to us and make sense of life. If you like, human beings are naturally seeking to make sense of things like the world around. How does it work? Why does it do things the way it does things? How can we use and benefit from everything that's around us? But we're also trying to make sense of the people around about us. How do we relate to them? What are they saying? What are they doing? What message are they communicating? And deep within it, we're trying to make sense of ourselves. In all of this, human beings are pattern seekers. Pattern seeking? A kind of definition of a human being, as some have suggested. You think about your own life, you realize very quickly it's quite a good description. We're all trying to make sense of things. Now, with that back cloth in mind, Let's get to the starting point of what is learning. If the natural thing that we all human beings have is a desire to make sense of things, then learning is making sense of things. How do schools and education in general help young people to make sense of things? The key word at the centre of everything is that word understanding, making sense of things. That's the central focus of all learning and it builds on the natural characteristic of human beings we're trying to make sense of, whether it's the young child, toddler, two or three years of age, right up to an academic PhD student. We're trying to make sense of things, to understand. That's the centre of learning. How do we help our students to do that? And I want to draw from some research evidence. There's an enormous amount of really high quality research evidence out there. And I'll only just draw on a small amount of it. What is the evidence from research that can help us as teachers so that we can enable our students to get the greatest understanding possible. We want to enhance their understanding. We want to develop them to the maximum. What does research show about how we might attempt to do this? That's the focus of this presentation. The problem is that in the past, and tragically still today, We've still got this carryover an idea that learning is a transfer process. Our job, with our heads full of information, is to transfer the information into the heads, into the brains of the learners in front of us. And we think of learning that way. And that's a wrong picture, and the research evidence shows it is wrong. That is not what learning is all about. It is not a transfer process. It's sense-making. 
We're trying to make sense of things around us. We're seeking to understand. And what research shows very clearly is that children go through cognitive developmental stages. The way a very young child can make sense of things is different from the way a teenager does. But you can help the cognitive development a little bit, but only to a limited extent. It's biologically fixed. But you can kind of enhance it, help it along its way by collaboration. But it's not just people working together. It's where the learner is guided and helped forward by someone who's just a bit more cognitively developed. And we can pull them forward. Now you see this in a family situation where the younger children are pulled forward cognitively by their older siblings, their brothers and sisters who are older, who are just slightly more developed. That's a classic example. Now there's another side to this. Research also shows that each of us, we construct our own meaning in our own way. We're making sense of things that happens inside our brains. And we do it in different ways and we come to different conclusions. And that places us teachers in a real problem. The class in front of us, our students may have constructed meaning. They may have come to understand things. And the way they've come to the meaning and understanding may not match exactly what we intended. The accepted meaning, if you like. They've drawn their own conclusions. They've constructed their own meaning. And we will not know that because we can't read their minds. The only way we can find out is to talk to them and listen to them afterwards. And even then we might not find out everything. We've got to be aware of that. That they're constructing understanding. They will make mistakes, but they'll do it in their own way. And we've got to allow for that and be aware that that's a possibility. And it appears that this broad pattern is true for us all. If you like, it's the way we've been wired up in our brains. We develop, but we also construct our own meaning. I want to focus on two researchers. The first one, David Osjubal. Now He was an educational psychologist and he reached almost the age of 90. Here's a picture of him as a young man. His greatest publications come from about the 1960s and 1970s. This is not recent work, but his work has been shown by those who followed to be robust and sound and wise. It's consistent with the evidence. Now, he was focusing on meaningful learning in the normal classroom situation, making sense of things, understanding in our modern language. And he thought about the normal classroom situation. That's where he did his work. And he provides in his writings a very clear distinction between what he called meaningful learning and rote learning. <clears throat> if you like understanding and memorization, and there's far too much memorization in education today, we should be aiming at meaningful learning, understanding. <clears throat> he accepted that. But he asked that fundamental question. How can we help the students sitting in front of us so that they make more sense of what we give to them, so that they can understand things better? His research came up with many things, but let me just pinpoint one or two. When new material is presented to us, we have already in our brains things that we have understood. Perhaps from previous lessons or perhaps from wider life. <clears throat> what he established, and it's perhaps the most important thing he established, was this. The new material if it's going to be understood, must be related to what we already understand. 
there's got to be an interaction between what the teacher, what you give them, and what they've already got. If understanding is to grow and develop, the new material must link to what they already understand, to enrich it. That's a fundamental principle. But I said two things. I'll put them down more formally here. The first one, what a student already understands, and indeed how they came to understand it, has a controlling effect on future learning. We have got to link our new material to previous understandings. That, of course, means that we must know what our students understand <clears throat> and the way they got that understanding and perhaps wrong ideas that they've got from the past. We've got to be aware of that and that requires a certain element of questioning. That's a fundamental principle for all and all teaching. And in a sort of a way, most teachers were subconsciously kind of aware of that. We're trying to tie things back to the past. We do it through questioning. We do it through statements like, do you remember last year we looked at? Now this links. We're linking new material onto previous understandings. But this one we find uncomfortable. That's also what he found. And research shows he was right. Meaningful learning is essentially unrelated to the extent of teacher-centeredness or discover, discovery strategies that are used. Just because you as a teacher are central in the learning process does not mean that meaningful learning is impossible. Just because you allow your students to work in groups and discover things doesn't guarantee there's meaningful learning. The two things are unrelated. Now that comes a bit of a shock to us, and he published that a long time ago, <clears throat> but somehow it seems to have got lost in the mists of literature. But research shows he was right, and research shows why he was right, <clears throat> which is what I want to look at. Because if the way you teach doesn't control the extent of meaningful learning, then what does? What is the key? What will enable your students to make more sense of what's given to them? And this is where the second researcher comes in. <clears throat> Slightly more recent, and he lived on till he was 87. Here's a picture of him in middle age. He had a large number of PhD students in his career. And his PhD students found he was the most wonderful supervisor. Brilliant, humorous, sensitive. But working with and through his students as a team, <clears throat> he found that the topics that were difficult to understand, which is what he was focusing on, they all involved what became known as information overload. Now we've got to understand what we mean by that phrase. <clears throat> information load is the number of pieces of information which the learner has to hold at the same time in order to perform the task successfully. Doesn't matter what the task is, it could be making sense of a sentence in a second language. Equally, it could be understanding some complex mathematical procedure. That's information overload, or information load defined, and if you've got too much to hold, well, meaningful learning no longer takes place. Let's go back to his description. After quite a few PhD students, a breakthrough came came in the 1970s and he suddenly started to realize particularly with the help of one brilliant student that it was the limitations of working memory capacity 
that held the key. And that was based on some remarkable research from the 1950s. Having come to that as a kind of hypothesis, subsequent students tested out the idea in several learning situations and it was shown to be correct. And there are probably scores if not hundreds of research studies that have followed that up. That led to the idea of information processing. Here's another description of a human being. We all just process information, all the things that fly at us every day. The way every human brain, basically we're all the same. The way every human brain handles the information that reaches our minds every waking moment of every day. Just ponder for a moment at just how much information bombards you every day from the moment you wake up radio television family friends the people in front of you think of the school student then faced with a teacher bombarding them with even more information then they go home in the evening and they get more information bombarding them perhaps from friends perhaps from a television program or doing homework we are bombarded with information how does the brain handle it? Surrounding us all the time are events, observations and instructions. That's the information that bombards us. We can hear it. We can see it. We can observe it. We can experience it. <coughs> it just flies at us. Now the model I'm going to present which Johnston presented in detail in many, many of his publications, is derived from a model going back to the 1960s, where it was put forward speculatively to be tested by some brilliant psychologists. We now know this model is not an invention. It's not someone's bright idea. It's based on extensive evidence and it predicts successfully. All the information that bombards you every day, if you let it into your brain, if you like, your brain would go up in a puff of blue smoke. It would never cope. In your brain, you've got what Johnson called a perception filter. You filter out all the information that's bombarding you so that only a minority gets through. And where it goes... It's a small part of the brain called the working memory. The working memory works on all the information that's got through, which is just a minority of what flies at you. It can then arrange to store it in the long-term memory. Less is known about this, but it appears that this is stored as a complex matrix of interlinked ideas. Everything you know, everything you understand, your attitudes, your feelings, your biases, they're all stored in the long-term memory, which appears to have infinite capacity. No one seems to run out in a lifetime. Now, the original ideas for this were developed from research from medical areas, picked up by clinical psychiatry and psychology, came into psychology, and are not all over the place in education. Tragically, this model is largely ignored in education today, despite the fact that it is well supported by the evidence and it predicts successfully. Look at the long-term memory on the right. Everything that you know of the past controls how you select. That's what David Oshibel found. Your past understandings and how you got them, maybe you didn't like it. That controls what gets in. Indeed, as you are watching to this presentation and listening to it, you are selecting. And what is already in your brain, your knowledge, understanding, attitudes, feelings and biases, that is controlling the selection process. I hope that I'm not overloading your working memory. 
far as you're distant from me, I will never know. This model is perhaps the single most important model in all of education. And again, I repeat, it is not speculative. It is not someone's bright idea. It's derived from evidence. But the real evidence that this model gives us a good picture is that it works. It predicts what will happen. And that's really helpful to us as teachers. Let's focus on the working memory, which is what Johnson was focusing on. Your working memory has a fixed capacity and you can't expand it. I've talked to medics and they can tell me where it is. It's used extensively in medicine where you're dealing with accident victims where someone has received a blow to the head, perhaps from a car accident. They have ways of testing it, checking that it's still working because it's the critical bit of your memory. This is not someone's figment of imagination. It has a physical location. Psychologists and psychiatrists have been building work on this for decades. And what you've got is determined genetically by what your parents have, the size of it. It's fixed and it's got a finite capacity. But it does vary slightly from age, from person to person. Its capacity is very easy to measure. There are two standard tests which have been used in large numbers of research studies and are known to be highly valid and reliable. Now it grows with age and it's got to its completed size, whatever you're going to get, by about age 16. But it's easily overloaded because it's small. Now there are good reasons why it is small, but that would take another presentation on its own. Originally it was known as the short-term memory, so people realized very quickly that was the wrong phrase. It's a working memory. It takes in things that have been selected in and it tries to make sense of them. It controls your thinking. It controls your understanding. It controls your problem solving. That's where all this is happening. It is a fixed finite size which is limited, can't be expanded. What we have to do is to ensure that our students use whatever they have to the maximum and that our teaching makes allowances for it. That's the central thing that controls extent of understanding. Now let's turn to some strategies in a practical sense that might help our students. Given that, if you like, brain architecture, how are we going to help our students? Well, that's the first step. On the basis of the evidence I've seen, in my opinion, the teaching about working memory should be central in all teacher education. But for us as practicing teachers, faced with your class the next day you face them, be aware of the problem. That's the first major step forward. Just be aware of this. You are seeking to get understanding to your students in front of you. You want them to make sense of what you're giving them. Doesn't matter what the subject is, you want them to make sense of it. 
their working memory is where they make sense of it and the size of the working memory will control how successful they'll be. Let's remind ourselves about the load. No matter what the task is, the number of pieces of information, and that includes procedures, which you've got to hold at the same time in order to perform the task successfully. Now let me give you a simple example. Imagine you're 17 or 18 years of age and it's the first time you're going to drive a car. You sit in the seat, you've got controls, buttons, a steering wheel, an ordinary car, three pedals at your feet, indicators, mirrors, information is flying at you. And if you think about it, you've got far too many pieces of information to take in at the same time in order to perform the task successfully, which is to make the car move forward safely and then to stop safely. It takes a lot of practice before some of the procedures in the car are automated. You don't have to think about them. So the working memory is not taking up space there. Information load is critical. A practical skill like learning a car, but you could see exactly the same thing if you're faced in mathematics with an algebra story problem. Some excellent research has been done looking at that. You can see the same thing if you're teaching a young child to read or an older child a second language. And when you come into subjects like chemistry and physics, information overload is just all over the place. It's the nature of the beast, of the subject matter. Now, age is important. That's the second thing we've got to recognise. Now, in a sense, we know that. There are things you cannot teach a 10-year-old, but you can teach a 16-year-old. And teachers have known that for years. Now, if you measure the working memory capacity of anyone 16 or over, that's the age when your working memory gets to its complete size, doesn't increase any further. The average capacity is about seven things you can hold. That's items of information and procedures. Now, there are one or two who are six or eight, and one or two who are five or nine. But almost everybody lies between five and nine. However, if you're 14, the average drops to 6. If you're 12, the average drops to 5. If you're 10, the average drops to 4. So there's a limit to what you can teach to younger children. It's more complex below the age of 10. Partly because it's difficult to measure with younger children. So age is important, and we are well aware of that just from experience. Now, the working memory has got two functions. It holds information temporarily. Now, that's when it was seen as the short-term memory. Before it was realized that was the wrong phrase. It was misleading. but it also processes that information for some purpose. Whether it's being able to read a sentence in a second language or solve a mathematical equation. Information is processed to get an outcome. Equally, it could be all the information that allows you to drive the car. Now, what has been found is that when you get to conceptual areas of the curriculum, they are the one that place the greatest problems on our learners. 
there are three subjects in schools, universities, and indeed in life that are highly conceptual, mathematics, chemistry, and physics. Now, there are areas in all subjects where there are great conceptual ideas that cause problems. But when you get a conceptual area, straight away a concept is built upon several ideas. So straight away you've got to hold several things at the same time to make sense of it. It puts pressure on the working memory. And if you go anywhere in the world, ask school students what are the hard subjects. They'll tell you mathematics, chemistry and physics. It's because the conceptual areas come in very early. In other subject areas, they come in just a little bit later. So that's a major factor. But working memory, your capacity, is not an indicator of intelligence. I have measured, or one of my students with me has measured, the working memory capacity of a lecture theatre of 200 undergraduate students. The average was seven. We have measured the working memory capacity of 16, 17 year old students at school. The average is seven. The university students have been selected in because they are more able. But their working memories still reflect the same pattern. It's not intelligence. I'm not sure, even sure what intelligence is. I think the word ability is perhaps a bit safer. Working memory is simply something to do with the way brains are wired up. It's how we humans have been designed to function. And our working memory capacities do vary slightly from person to person. And the differences can make a big difference to performance in schools and universities. I'm going to put up eight letters. Now remember, the average working memory capacity is seven. So for most of you watching this, that's bigger than the average. Now if I fade it out, I wonder how many of you could just write down these letters in the right positions. I suspect not many of you will be successful. Let's bring them back. Now suppose I rearrange these letters. At the moment they're apparently meaningless. So our working memories can't get meaning from them, and that's how we were designed to work. So we find it difficult. If I rearrange them, I come up with a word. Now, you may not have heard that word, chunking. The word chunk and the idea of chunking was invented by a psychologist, a brilliant psychologist in the 1950s. He was the one that did the breakthrough work on working memory. Only in his day it was called short-term memory. They didn't know. He developed the tests to measure it. In fact, his paper, people say it is the most cited paper in all subjects, across all subjects, in all disciplines, ever. One of the most remarkable insights into how the human brain works. Brilliant work. And one of the things he found was that if people can group things together so they're seen as one, you can remember the word chunking. You probably won't remember the eight letters on the left on their own. But as soon as you get meaning on these eight letters, it's seen as one thing. Your working mem now can cope. And that's what we do all the time. We try to group things together to make sense of them because it's a meaningful word. Can we help our students to group things together so they're seen as one? That certainly seems to be a possible and leads to greater success.
So I summarize it that way. Now, sometimes you group things together by giving people a mnemonic. I will never forget in a maths class when I was a young boy, a maths teacher teaching us how to spell the word isosceles. He gave us a simple way to remember it. I will never forget it. I-S-O-S-C-E-L-E-S. -E -E I can spell it today. Because it comes from another language, not English, it did not make sense to us at the time. Equally, in physics or mathematics, being able to put something down as an equation, the equation groups ideas together. Equally, in the humanities, a word can group ideas together. A sentence can group ideas together. A phrase can group ideas together. A picture or diagram can group ideas together. Makes them more meaningful. You see, we're trying to get understanding from the jumble of information that flies at us. And the way we approach our teaching doesn't hold the key. It's how you use the method that you use that's critical. Not the method itself. And the key is this. Whatever way you teach, if you do it and you work within the learner working memory capacities, you'll get success in terms of understanding. The research evidence is enormous on that. Whether you're standing in front of a class, whether they're doing practical work, whether they're working in groups, whether they're watching a computer program, <clears throat> if they're working within their working memory capacities, they can get it. It doesn't follow they will get it. They've got to be motivated. But they can get it. And if you go outside that, doesn't work. Now, it's worthwhile actually going onto a computer terminal and going onto a few websites. Most websites break that simple rule. There's far too much on one frame. You notice in this presentation I've built up frames bit by bit. And I have not used long lists of bullet points. Your working memory can't get that. Doesn't work. But you've got to know what the capacity is of your students in front of you. But you've got to know their average capacity. But remember there are a few who are below average in their working memory capacity and they're not necessarily got less ability. It's just the way their brains are wired up. They can be highly successful in understanding. They can learn to work within that capacity that they've been given. But we've got to know what it is for the age of students we teach. So we provide the new material in any way you like. So you can do it where you're in control at a presentation or printed materials you've prepared in advance or a book. It could be visual materials. It could be computer-based materials. All devised. Equally, you could have the students working together. Group work. Could be practical activities. It could be problem-based learning. I just give some examples. It doesn't matter whatever you do. The information goes into working memory. And if the working memory can cope, you've got the potential for understanding. If you overload the working memory, understanding is a casualty. That's the goal. And the working memory is the key. Because that's what controls understanding. And whatever method of teaching we use, if we're aware of that, we can work within it. Very quickly, as I come to an end, just one study. There are many, many studies, but I pick one. 
It involved 800 school students, senior school students. And all the researcher did was replace the textbook by materials written by the researcher. Now, he did it with four groups of 200, and they were, these were major areas of the curriculum. So the experiment ran for several months. Now, that was his aim. Could he recast highly conceptual materials to reduce the working memory overload? He was testing to see if it was possible to do. A previous research study on a much smaller scale had suggested it was possible. He now did it on a big scale. He couldn't control the curriculum. No teacher was trained. In fact, he never even visited the school. It was all done electronically delivered electronically to the schools. There was no change in the time allocation for the classes and no change in the assessment methods. It was simply replace the textbook by materials which were designed to reduce working memory overload. That was his outcome. An average examination mark improvement of 13%. Now, if you could improve the performance of your students, average, the whole lot moves up. By that amount, you'd be swinging from the lights with delight. That shows possibilities, but it's simply changing the textbook. Most textbooks, sadly, that I have looked at in subject areas where I understand it, overload the working memory, the way they present the material. What's the way forward for us? This is a very superficial summary, just give you pointers because I'm trying to provoke thought and discussion. Just analyse what you teach and see if you can present the idea step by step to break up complex areas into steps. Some of you will be doing this already, almost instinctively. That's sound. You can't look inside their brains to see if there's overload, but you can watch their eyes. I have seen this when I was practicing as a teacher again and again. Sometimes I was quite humiliated by it. I can remember one lesson where I thought I had prepared brilliantly, presented brilliantly, and everything went fine. But I saw that glazed over look. I didn't know what it meant till I asked a few questions, and one student very politely said to me, and this was a very bright group, Please, sir, I don't think I understand anything you said. I got it wrong. I'd overloaded the working memory. I had to start again taught me a lesson, but it gave me wonderful rapport with that class. You see, if we ask questions, sometimes we can find out. Bring things together. If two or three ideas are brought together, the working memory can see them as one. That takes pressure off the working memory. That's chunking in the language of Miller of the 1950s. The work of Osjabal. Link new ideas onto ideas they have already understood. So we must know what they already understand. How they get it. And remember that. Layout and presentation. It's critical. I have tried in this presentation to work within the working memory capacities of an adult audience, where the average is seven. But some will be a bit below and a bit above. I have not used bullet points, but I use them here to bring ideas together that I've touched upon already. But I bring them in one at a time so that your working memory can cope with each one individually. 
Remember that. That's why visual material can sometimes help, but it doesn't always help. A student of mine in mathematics showed that diagrams can sometimes make the performance worse. And she was able to work out why. Comes back to working memory. Sometimes the visual materials are so complex, and that's true in most textbooks, they don't help. But they can help if they're used carefully. And perhaps that's the best piece of advice I could leave with you. Remember what it was like when you were a teenager or whatever age you teach. That may be hard going. And try to put yourself back in the place of your young learners. How do they see it? How are they going to get something that's maybe very familiar to you and very easy to you? Try to put yourself in the shoes of your learners. And I mention this somewhat diffidently. Youth has been based on chapter 4 of that book. You can purchase separate chapters. It's pages 63 to 84. And the book's got a title that plays in all of this, Making Sense of Learning. And it looks at it from all kinds of angles. This presentation has been designed to provoke thought and questioning. I hope it's done that. Follow it up by using resources online or whatever you can get them. And allow your understanding of working memory to inform your teaching so that your students will gain ever-increasing understanding.